when challenges come, do you, do you fold or do you want to overcome? Okay. Can anybody relate to this? And I'm, I'm, I'm not, not joking here, okay? You're so frustrated about something that you just throw something. Or am I the only one? And, and, and then it didn't make you feel much better, so you threw something else. Uh, the, 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 tr- the truth is, sometimes that's the way we feel. And, and, and there's, there's something real about, about o- overcoming how to fix this car part. And, and YouTube doesn't do it for you, but it, it, it helps you. I just wish those guys were real and say, I've tried this 13 times. I've been so mad about the last 31 times. Tri- I'm, I'm going to do it right this time. And sh- I, w- I wish they would just show some emotion rather than just be these little basic teachers. Because um, I, I, I feel like they're, they, they, they can't relate to my, my fear of like jumping in at this, at this level. And, and, and the book of James really, it, it is such a practical book. Uh, it's a book that, that, that speaks about never quitting. Um, there are so many situations that arise in the book of, of James. Uh, the idea of perseverance comes up. The idea of temptation comes up. Favoritism comes up. Being a church of action comes up. Taming our tongue. Uh, learning the difference between bragging and boasting and what we brag and boast in. Uh, learning about submission to God and learning about praying in those most difficult times simply the book of James is a classic practical book for everyday life that I think that you and I are going to enjoy very much these next several weeks let me let me read the let me read the first four verses of of uh, of, of James here okay um, this letter is from James a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ I'm writing to the 12 tribes, the Jewish believers scattered abroad, greetings. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. You know, James, is, is, he's, he's, he's really a lot like you and I, more than we would ever imagine. And why is that important? Because if we're going to spend uh, 12 or 13 weeks walking through these life situations in the book of James, I want somebody who we believe that we can relate to. Um, how is he like us? Because he, he, asked some, he had to be asking some transparent questions. Um, you know, did, did, did he wonder who God really was? Well, he's the half brother of Jesus. So, uh, d- 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 just ponder this for a second, okay? He grew up and he heard this. Why can't you be more like your brother? Yeah. <laughs> he heard this from, from his mom talking to his son. Just who do you think you are? I, I mean, she, 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 she and... Joseph, they, they, they raised the son of God and they raised somebody else. Did they raise them differently? Um, many of us can relate to comparison within our own family. Many of us can have those, those questions of, hey, hey, is it worthwhile serving God? Um, who is God? <coughs> What's he really like? Um, Another way that we can relate to him is some, some of us came to Christ later on in life. James did not believe in Jesus until the resurrection took place. I mean, uh, I don't know what the age span is. I, I, I couldn't figure out what the age span from, from Jesus to James was. But when, when, when Jesus is 33 and Jesus rises from the dead, that's when he believes that my brother, my half-brother, this guy who grew up in my family, he is more than just a half-brother to me. <clears throat> yes, he grew up with all the religiosity of stuff. Some of you in this room, you've probably asked this question. My kids were raised in the church. What happened to them? My brother was raised in the church. What happened to them? Man, my, my sister was raised in the church. What happened to them? 
And some of our grandparents are probably saying to us, hey, I raised you in the church and you just attend only. What's the matter with you? Jump in. Get involved. You know, this book starts out with a very profound, simple thought. And, and I, read, I, I read out of the New Translation, <clears throat> and it uses the word this. This letter is from James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He simply clarified his choice of who and what he was going to serve. He clarified it. You and I need to clarify who and what we serve. Um, he's not a servant of his brother. He's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a difference between saying, I, I serve my brother and I serve him who is God in the flesh. In those days, there was a lot of things to choose from to serve. Many people chose to serve the Roman government. And they just paid homage to the Roman government, what the Roman government said they did. And there are some that says, I don't care what the Roman government says. I'm going to obey what Christ says. I don't care what the Roman government says. I'm going to obey what the, what the scriptures say. Uh, they had a choice to obey the, uh, not just the Roman government, but the Roman military. There's a big difference between choosing to obey the military and choosing to obey the Lord. Some people had the opportunity to <clears throat> serve the God of money. But above all else, he chose to serve Christ. Yes, he waited and he acted upon it, but he acknowledged that Jesus was the Holy One, that he was the Almighty One, and there are many more things in life to choose from to serve than we could ever imagine, but there's something different about proclaiming that that is Jesus Christ. His, his choice to follow Christ literally changed the trajectory of his life. He was not just an additional friend. Um, it wasn't a once in a week encounter with the people at church, but it was a commitment of his will. <clears throat> uh, yesterday I, was, I performed a wedding ceremony for a, uh, a, a young guy who, um, he was a student of mine in, in, at Jim Elliott Christian High School. And um, he, he's one of those guys who, truthfully, he is gifted beyond your wildest imagination. But when it comes to schoolwork, he has zero interest in it. Because he doesn't want to just know stuff. He wants to know stuff to be able to do stuff. And he had six friends that were all exactly the same way. And as a result of that, they were disoriented in class and they were... Um, they were troublemakers in class, not because, not because they were troublemakers. Their minds were just on other things. They literally couldn't help it. Um, and I let all six of these guys uh, and him, I let them all sit together. I had them all in one class. I said, you guys can all sit over here together, okay? I said, two conditions. One is this. I said, um, you, guys, you guys are going to be good for each other. Because I want you to know that uh, I'm never going to discuss who caused any problems if I have any problems, all seven of you are in trouble. No questions asked. Can you live with that? Yeah. Mr. Arthur, are you going to let us sit by our friends? I said, yeah. Second of all is this. I said, we, got, we have a group project every quarter, and you guys all have to work together. And if you don't get a B, you got to come into my room at lunch every day for three weeks until it's done. What if we could get it done in one day? I don't care. I said, it's three weeks. They turn in their first project. One of the kids goes, Mr. Arthur, I got an A in Bible, man. He goes, he, he goes, I said, this is the funnest class I ever had in the whole world. And I said, I said, Matt, this guy who's getting married, I said, Matthew, I said, uh, you're good at a lot of things that you don't get grades for. And I said, and so are all the rest of you guys. Now, why do I bring this up? Because he has a will. And he has a desire, and he has a commitment capacity that's down in what you and I refer to as the heart. That can get things done more than you could ever imagine. This guy manages um, a lot, a lot of property. He's a great farmer. The truth is, is that yesterday he made a commitment to a girl. And it wasn't just a verbal 
It was a commitment of his will. James clarified his desire to have his commitment to Jesus Christ change his entire life. When was the last time you heard somebody ever say, hey, because of what scripture says, I'm doing this in my marriage. When was the last time you heard somebody say, because of who Jesus Christ is and what the scriptures say, I'm raising my child a certain way. How many of you ever said that because, because I'm a believer and because I believe in the scriptures, I want to know what God wants me to do with my gifts and my skills and my talents, and I want to serve him above everything else in all the world. Because of what God has gifted me with and because of my commitment to God, I want to not just be doing things with people, I want to be mentoring them. And I want to be a light into the world to them. I'm not just simply in this role with people, I literally am bringing forth the message of Jesus Christ by living it the way that I ought to and simply saying, I'm a servant of God above everything else that exists in the world. God's holiness is transforming my life. His majesty is not old school. His holiness is not old school. Being a servant is not old school. It's always school. I don't even know if that's a phrase, but I thought it sounded good, so I wrote it down. Our culture demands justice, equality, peace, and love, but the truth is none of those can exist without the holiness and the majesty of who God is. It's not just the secular culture that has abandoned this truth and has stopped clarifying and lifting up. The church has done a lousy job too. You know, there's a lot of churches that, uh, that they, they've tried to do so much good in the world's eyes that they're forgetting to proclaim who Jesus is. The more and more the cultural influences us, the more and more his holiness takes a back seat to things. And there's, we don't see a practical, functional purpose in our life for being a servant of God, or as James puts in, in, in the New Living Translation, a slave of Christ. It's very possible for devout followers of Christ to genuinely believe in the doctrine of holiness, yet in our daily life practice holy less living. Imagine acknowledging that your half-brother, who you thought was your brother, who you've heard the stories of from mom, and you make the decision that he is the almighty one. Change the trajectory of your life. You know, he's sort of like Abram. Abraham. Abraham lived in a world of many gods and many governments to choose from. God called him. He was from the land of many gods. That's a small g. Okay. Um, uh, Jesus, warned, Jesus warned the idea of, of uh, you can't serve more than one thing. Abraham left the, all the foreign gods in the land of Ur, which is kind of near something that we would know as the Persian Gulf today. Um, uh, this all took place right after the Tower of Babel where, where man's desire was to reach God on their own merit, not on the merit of God coming down to us. Um, he was sort of like Joshua. Joshua presents this incredible invitation towards the end of his life in Joshua 24 where he says... Um, uh, choose this day whom you will serve. And then he goes on to talk about the foreign gods of the, of, of the, of the past and, 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 and of Yahweh the Lord. And, and he says, choose for your day, choose yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He clarified his choice. He acted on his choice. And then he in absolute willingness and obedience simply left them with the idea of choosing the Lord Jesus, choosing the Lord. Christ hadn't been born yet, but, 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 but he was choosing the majesty of God above everything else. He's sort of like Paul. Paul became a believer and started living for God. His perspective changed. He evaluated uh, things. He, he confronted the gods of the world and said, they're false, they're false, they're false. 
He considered the former things in life garbage compared to following Jesus Christ. That is why Paul had great joy because he was living for the thing that mattered most, which is Jesus Christ. James makes his faith known, and you and I need to do this as well. We need to trust not just the results of God, but trust God himself. If God chooses to keep blessing with something, and that blessing leaves or stops, do we give up on God? No. Um, this, this passage speaks about uh, another thing that comes up in this passage, the idea of confirming our faith. Um, many people in the church grow up with this. My goal is to avoid conflict and never have to discuss what I believe with anybody. Well, how are people going to find out if we don't discuss what we believe a little bit? I'm supposed to tell you hello from a guy named Sean Alloy. Those of you who uh, don't know Sean, Sean was an active member here. He was an elder. He worked with the youth here. And um, in the middle of COVID, he and his wife, Cassie, and their four kids, they moved to Tennessee. And um, he goes, John, he goes, we, we, we went to dinner. He goes, John, I got to tell you about one of my best friends. He goes, he goes, he's exactly like you. And I said, isn't it great? There's two of us. And, and, and he said, John, he goes, he told me, he goes, my favorite thing is sitting in, is sitting in an airplane in seat B. And, he's, and, 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 and I know where he's going. How many of you know where I'm going with this? He goes, because there's somebody always in seat A and there's somebody almost always in seat C. And by the time this flight is over, they're going to know that I have a love for them and a love for Jesus Christ. I get a chance at 30, 36,000 feet to share the love of Jesus Christ with somebody. He goes, and they can't go anywhere. <laughs> Sean goes, you need to be my friend, John, because he does that same thing. The truth is, this friend of Sean's, he has so much confirmation of who Christ is that he can't stop talking about it. He goes, John, and he says, you know, some people like that drive you crazy, and other people motivate you to want to be like that. Um, you know, the idea of confirming our faith is something that's very important. Um, how many of you liked spelling tests growing up? How many of you like, those are the worst thing because you got to get ready for them? Anybody ever tried taking a spelling test without studying the spelling words? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We, 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 we got friends here, okay? Um, you know, the truth is the purpose of a spelling test isn't to see how many you got wrong. You know what I mean? It's really to confirm, it's to confirm what they hoped you would be learning. Um, I remember going to take my driver's exam, and taking a driving exam is, is, is really not about, the purpose is not to fail you, the purpose is to confirm, it's simply to confirm what you're good at and what you're not. Um, you know, some of us are people who, um, in school, uh, you know, some people would say, um, I never raised my hand. Well, I don't ask, I never asked students to raise their hand, I just picked on who I thought needed a reminder that they needed to know that. The truth is, I picked on the kid who didn't know the answer, not because I was trying to frustrate him, but because I wanted to know that you will know the answer eventually. And I did not accept something called, I don't know. They were only allowed to say one phrase, I don't know yet. Because if I'm going to spend time as a teacher with 31 students in the room and ask a question, that is obviously important enough for everybody in the room to know, at least once in their life, to know and to be confirmed. And this idea of confirming our faith is exactly the same thing. And in verse 3, there's this incredible thought that comes about you and I confirming our faith where it simply says in verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. <laughs> this is a climbing rope. And, and, and a climbing rope, you and I, anybody here climb? Okay. Uh, a climbing rope is a great tool. It is used mostly as a safety device 
than it is a climbing device. It ought to be called safety rope, not climbing rope. And, and this particular rope that I have in front of you, okay, this is designed to withstand uh, 5,100 pounds of pressure. That's the breaking point of, of the rope. And it's a, it's a special design, and I picked this one out of all the ones I have at my house because you can begin to see that there's, uh, I think there's 12 little inner ropes, and then there's, then there's one rope on the outside. And the truth is this. If you were a climber, wouldn't you be glad that somebody had tested this stuff? Is your goal to see it be tested? The answer is no. Let's try that again. Is your goal to see that it will be tested? But when it comes time to be tested, are you glad it's real? That's the way our faith is with Jesus Christ. We simply do not need to take this approach in life that says, Lord, I hope nobody ever asks me a question. I hope I know the answer when that question comes. I hope that when that trial comes, that I'm hanging on to something that is worth as much poundage as I think it is because the testing will come. Listen to the verse again. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. The testing of the rope proves its worth. And you and I need to have some great enthusiasm about saying, you know what, I don't know the answer to everything. And when I do get asked, it's okay to say, I don't know yet, but I'm going to look it up because if it's that important to you, it's that important to me, and I'd be happy to try to help you out. There's something about the confirmation of our faith that we shouldn't fear. It should be, if somebody asks me a question, I don't know, I get the opportunity to learn something else. Is that incredible? I love hearing stories of faith because they teach me about God's power in ways that I haven't necessarily experienced. Our human understanding says, I know better. My intuition says, I know more than God. My understanding of God says, he's omniscient. You know, the, the, the issue is this, is that serving God is not natural in our world. <laughs> This, this is pretty mind-blowing if you think about it. Many teachings go against human reasoning. Creation doesn't seem to fit the view of biology and science in the school classroom. Does that make it wrong? No. It means that we need to do a better job of understanding who this God is so that we can believe that it really happened. Man's view of justice and, and equality are often contrary to God's teaching. Many people in the world who are pretty smart and in positions of authority accept and promote positions against what the scriptures teach. Things like premarital intimacy, homosexuality, the number of genders in the world, if it feels good, do it, issues of abortion and things like that. And it's hard because we have a tendency to be like the people in the time of the judges where the classification of the people of the judges in the Old Testament was everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And what James is saying here is, hey, I'm going to do what is right in the eyes of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a servant of his. I'm not going to pursue my own selfish desires. I simply want what Jesus wants. God teaches us to put others before ourselves. That's, that's contrary to, that's not natural. God teaches us to love our enemies. That's not natural. The freedom of, speech, freedom of speech in our world today simply says, hey, let's use God's name in vain because we can, we can damn the greatest name in the world. Those, those, that's, that's not serving God. His ways are not our ways. It's not just believing in God, but it's denying our own reasoning, knowing that his ways understand some things greater than us. It's not just different thoughts, it's higher thoughts. We're told to deny ourselves Well, the world says, no, treat yourself like a king. You deserve it. I want you to know that one of the most overused phrases in our world is, you deserve it. By golly, the answer is, no, we don't. It is just a blessing that is 
an element of joy. That I can't believe I got this. It doesn't matter if it's a sandwich from Subway or a new house. We don't deserve any of that stuff. We deserve separation from God. But he loves us so much. You know, another reason why uh, serving God is not natural is because we tend to be people pleasers. Um, we enjoy time with other people and we don't want to stick out. Uh, I'd like to read you something. This is, um, I thought this was fantastic and I didn't want to steal it. I just wanted to read it. When we adopt the idea that salvation will make our lives easier, we are in for a shock. Those who have come to Christ for the goodies he offers often turn away when they realize that accepting him means they have a new boss. When Jesus was on earth, the crowds loved the free food and the miracles. But when he began to talk about the hard things of the gospel, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. We cannot serve both God and ourselves. Living for God means we make a final decision about who is in charge. When our flesh begins to reassert its rights, we take it back, we take it back to the cross and allow it to die in his presence. When sin tempts the decisions that have already been made, we seek God's will over our own. We need to ask ourselves, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God Almighty? Or am I trying to please God? The answer is plain. If we're still trying to please people, I will never be a servant of God. Living for God may be difficult, but it is not joyless. I want to repeat that phrase. Because if we don't capture the joy that's there, why do it? Living for God may be difficult, but it is not joyless. Paul wrote his most important joyful letter while suffering persecution in Rome in a prison. And he simply says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Our perseverance is about who he is. Oh, who he is. Who he is. That's what our perseverance is about. Um, I've had a chance to go backpacking in, um, in Yosemite a lot of times. I've been to Half Dome 17 times, and it was an 18th time where we made it to the bottom of Half Dome, and the thunderstorms were coming, and so we couldn't go up the cables and everything. And we're there, and this this junior high boy with us, and it was a junior high boy's backpacking trip, and um, he didn't want to go up. And I said, I said, uh, Mike, I said, do they got shaved ice at the top up there? I, he goes, shaved ice. He goes, like, what kind of flavors they guys probably changed a lot. You know? <laughs> he, goes, he goes, well, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <laughs> and so you go, if you don't know, you go, you're, you're, you're literally over a 75-degree angle, okay? And, and you have these cables, and these cables are about armpit high on a six-foot man. So some of these kids are going with the cables over the head. You're just, you're just walking up, and about every, about every nine or ten feet, there's a, there's a two-by-six on the ground, and there's these implanted cables in the, and, and we're going up, and he goes, man, there's shaved ice. I'm like, man, I should have never said that. I should have never said that. I go, I'm going, man, did you forget about the shaved ice? We get up to the top, seriously. He goes, and somebody goes, uh, Mike, um, he was joking about the shaved ice. He goes, I'm so mad at you, John. And he walked, literally, he went right back down. 700 feet, he went right back down. He never even looked. Afterwards, he goes, what'd you do that to me for? I said, because I wanted you to see the most beautiful sight you would ever see in your life and that you would understand what beauty really is all about. I said, you love talking about trees and plants and other things, and I wanted you to have a view that you would never, ever be able to possibly duplicate. And I said, and I thought that that might get you to the top. He said, yeah, it did, but I'm mad at you. <laughs> you know, the truth is, the truth is this. Um, I was trying to get him to do something and not quit because I thought that he would enjoy the majesty of what he saw up there. 
I probably chose the wrong thing. He, he forgave me later on, okay? I, I did buy him a snow cone at the store on the way home. But I want you to know this, is that uh, the rest of this book really deals with things about faithful living and not ever giving up. Don't give up when temptation takes place. Don't give up when, um, when, when trials come. Don't give up when, when speech becomes a challenge. Don't give up when life seems out of control. And, and the rest of the book is really, it's written by this guy who acknowledged that Jesus, his half-brother, was God in the flesh. And as a result of that, it changed his life dramatically. I hope that these next 12, 13 weeks of this journey would simply affect you in a way that simply go, man, I've, oh man, I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out on that joy because as my faith gets, as, as uh, uh, if, my, if and when my faith gets tested, it's proving how strong my relationship with Jesus really is. Let's pray together. Father God, we know that as a believer that we are not alone. That perseverance is worthwhile because of who you are and because you make yourself available to us in relationship. Father God, as we sing this closing song this morning, I pray that we would comprehend the joy that there is of you. and That we would understand that we are not alone and that you are there with us. May we persevere because of you. May we persevere because of the uh, idea of you being there, because of the idea of who you are. And we would make ourselves a servant or a slave unto you because you are in charge of everything. And you made everything. And you are eternal. And your holiness prevails. And we want to submit ourselves to that. May we become servants of yours. Thank you that we aren't alone. Amen.